Divine Truth Feedback Discussions Jesus, Mary, and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. This is Session 1, Part 4 of the discussion Forgiveness and Dealing with Those Who Harm Me, where Jesus and Mary give some personal feedback to Sandra Tsai about her questions relating to God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance and address many common false beliefs regarding forgiveness, repentance, love, obligation, harm, and abuse. This session was recorded on the 19th of June 2018 from 11 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. The effects of desiring to forgive. So we'll have a reminder from Sandra's letter, just to remind ourselves of what she said. Mm -hmm. She said, not forgiving lets your enemies win, but forgiving means that now you have obligations to love your enemies and to do for them. Do you, Mary, Jesus, Lena, or anyone that has forgiven know this to be true? So we've already spoken in this discussion about the effects of not forgiving, refusing to forgive. Mm -hmm. Now I'd like to contrast that with actually forgiving. Because Sandra has obviously misconceptions about the effects of her forgiving. Mm. So she asks you directly, and I'll ask you directly <laughs> if you know it to be true or not. <laughs> mm. um, and here we could probably define our enemy as a person who harms us or who willfully desires to do harm to us. I don't really like the word enemy very much. But. Well, no, she's defined her enemy as that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't feel the same way. Um, I feel the fact that she's used the word enemy is an issue in itself, actually. Yeah. yeah. Because the reality is that, you know, the people who harm you are not, don't have to be your enemies. Mm -hmm. While they may consider themselves to be your enemy, and that might be the reason why they are even attempting to harm you, you don't have to consider them your enemy. Mm -hmm. And I feel the fact that you do is usually an issue in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact mm -hmm. that you consider people to be your enemies mm -hmm. is, a, is an issue within itself. Mm -hmm. I sort of see everybody as having emotional injuries. Some of them, they act out violently and uh, can attempt to cause you harm violently. Others uh, are acted out emotionally more often than not. Um, they're all just injuries yeah. that people can perfect or not. And sooner or later, in given the long, long enough time, we'll all become friends. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it just depends on how long that time is. Very um, good. Mm. Very good. So, um, all right, let's move on and speak about specifics. Sure. How does forgiving affect my abuser? Or perhaps we can say here, how does my forgiving affect someone who has done harm? How does my forgiving someone who's harmed me affect that person? How does <laughs> Didn't my make forgiving it someone who's harmed me affect that person? Okay. Affect that person who's harmed me yeah. directly. I want to talk about that direct relationship. Sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because it, obviously today, not all harm is considered by people to be abuse. Mm. Whereas from God's perspective, all harm is abusive. It has some negative uh, power, you know, in itself Some when, when we harm another person. So the word abuse here is interesting in itself in, yeah. the, in that we're just now talking about any person who has harmed us from God's perspective. Yes. Whereas uh, the average person on earth would look at that and go, and, and we'll have to change the title here, obviously, because, it, because the average person would go, Oh, are we talking about abusers? Mm. And for the average person, they wouldn't consider themselves to be an abuser. Mm. Although from God's perspective, everybody who acts in harm of another, which we've defined already, yeah. uh, or who sins against God's laws is an abuser. Yes. So so this is a... You Hence know, more, my preference for it in the title, because it says the one thing in a short way of saying it. Yeah, that's it? right. So, yeah. so how does my forgiving affect my abusers? Or how does my forgiving affect the people who have harmed me, and mm -hmm. um, how does my forgiving them affect me, them? them? Well, uh, you know, um, there's usually, there's, there's a way it could affect them, and then there's a way it usually does affect them. Yeah. 
isn't it? And mm -hmm. the way it usually does affect them is they usually become enraged, to be honest. Uh, the main reason why they become enraged is because now we are seeing their sin. Mm. And for the average person, once you see their sin, yeah. they no longer feel that, uh, you know, their, their sin is now no longer hidden. Mm -hmm. It is exposed. And because it's now exposed uh, to them, you know, at mm -hmm. least through some attempt to expose to them. And usually most people get very, very angry and upset because mm -hmm. they are wanting to continue that sin. And, and now they, in your company at least, yeah. and are being prevented from doing so. Mm. Yeah, and I find this very interesting because it's because forgiveness requires us to go through this process of becoming very sensitive and knowledgeable about what harm was done and how it affected us, that the, what you've just described occurs because now, um, say you've harmed me, now I'm sitting in front of you in full knowledge of what you've done. Whereas before that point, a number of different emotional conditions can exist within me. One of them is that I'm almost supporting the denial of the harm. You mean the person who's been harmed? Yes, is me. Is supporting the denial in the person who was doing the harming. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, that, that is frequently the case, isn't it? It is frequently because either I just want to numb out to it myself, as we've discussed. No, that, or... There's a high likelihood you want to continue the relationship with yes. the person for some reason of your own. Yes. So you see this a lot with parents and children where a child wants to continue the relationship with a parent but on, on, the child, you know, on the child's terms. Mm -hmm. And so the child gets angry with the parent when the parent doesn't meet the terms, whether the parent does so in an abusive way or in a non-abusive way, the yeah. child will still get angry. Yeah. And so frequently we have demands upon others to, to meet our addictions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and often the case is that if, if they do, then we like that. Mm -hmm. And so we pander to them until they do. Yeah. And, and that's frequently what happens. There's also another dynamic that can happen, isn't there, where um, I can be saying, you've harmed me, but I'm going to punish you for it. And almost as if the person who has harmed me feels that that can be kind of that the reception of the anger is almost a trade-off for them getting away from really uh, feeling or experiencing what's been done, as it is for me, it, it, like a self-attacking dynamic almost where I'm attacking and the person who harmed me is receiving that in a way that is not uh, emotionally sensitive. It's just like a, I, I see this in relationships where someone's done something to hurt the other person and that's been exposed in some way. And then there's like a new uh, arrangement that starts to happen where it's like, I'm going to hold on to my anger about what you've done rather than release it. And I get to be angry at you whenever I want. Mm. And the person who's done it goes, yeah, look, I've, I don't really want to deal with why I did that or repent. So I'm so going to keep gonna, paying the guilt of get your anger. I'll be a bit ashamed and ashamed, not real shame, you know, and guilty. And, and it, it helps both parties avoid the real recognition emotionally of what's happened. Yeah, uh, the best way to liken that is initially there, there was harm perpetrated by this person, the, mm -hmm. say the person on the left, you know, yep. there's harm, harm perpetrated by that person. And then the person on the right feels the, doesn't feel the harm mm -hmm. and just recognises it as normal. Yeah. Now under those circumstances, the person who did the harm will probably keep harming. Yes. And the person who receives the harm will probably keep receiving it because they don't see it as anything other than normal. Yeah. And then what happens, the person who receives the harm starts feeling like, no, this is wrong, this is not normal. Mm -hmm. So they, they now are in this state where, no, it's wrong, it's not normal. Now, for many people in that state, they still don't want to feel the grief about the harm. Yeah. They've just recognised that it's wrong and it's not normal. Mm -hmm. That's all they've recognised. Mm -hmm. So what they start doing now is they try to get power over the person who harmed them. Mm -hmm. And the way they do that is they start trying to, they act out their rage and their anger about the harm mm -hmm. to the person. Mm -hmm. The person who's been harmed still wants the relationship. Yes. Right? They haven't given up the concept of a relationship. They still want one. Mm -hmm. And that's why they now feel they should be able to dump on the person who harmed them, mm -hmm. right? Which is actually wrong or a sin from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. 
to dump on someone who's actually harmed you is a sin from God's mm -hmm. perspective anyway. Mm -hmm. But you feel justified in that process. And I've done that myself occasionally, mm -hmm. very occasionally, but mm -hmm. some, you know, twice or so <laughs> in my life, I think I can remember doing it. Yeah. But, but, you know, where you feel like doing it, you know, yeah. like you feel like harming the other, right? Yeah. Now, now, that's not right either, um, because that's still ex wanting the relationship with yeah. the person. Yeah, and the relationship is going to be very much dependent upon whether this person is repentant, the yes. person on the, who perpetrated the harm is repentant, yeah. and whether I, the person who received the harm, is forgiving. Exactly. That's what the relationship is going to be dependent that's upon. That's the only way the relationship can be re-established, isn't it? Well, that's the only way it can be yeah, healed, healed, the whole yeah. relationship. But what frequently happens in this secondary stage, so the first stage is the harm. Yeah. The secondary stage is the person being harmed now wanting to reinforce to the person who did the harming that their harming was wrong, right? And they may get involved in some kind of uh, sort of uh, pseudo acknowledgement of that without really feeling anything. Well, they'll obviously cycle from yeah. anywhere from complete denial yeah. right the way through to guilt, yeah. right? But still not feeling the reason why they did it. Mm -mm. So guilt is a payment for yeah. not having to feel actually. Yeah. So, so the person who's been the perpetrator will obviously might be in complete denial they did anything right the way through to feeling guilty that they did do something, yeah. but still not actually feeling about it. Yeah. So this second stage, the, the, the person who's been harmed feels justified in their anger mm -hmm. because the person who did the harming isn't repentant yet. Yeah. Right. Whereas a person who forgives goes to another stage. How does that alter the dynamic? Well, the person who forgives recognizes completely within themselves the harm being mm -hmm. done. They release the emotion that they've felt as a result of the harm being done. And because they're in this state where they can no longer be harmed, yeah. right? Because I've released not only the, um, the, harm. the harm itself, but anything that might have dealt, allowed them to receive it. Mm -hmm. Now they're in a dynamic with this person where it doesn't matter what this person does. This person can rage and rant or feel guilty or whatever. Mm -hmm. This person, the person who's done, been harmed and who's forgiven, forgiven, still will know that the person who has done the harming is not repentant. Yeah. And, and they will actually be able to feel when the person is actually repentant. Yes. Right. Because they'll feel within them the same acknowledgement of the exact harm and how, the impact exactly. that it had. Exactly. Now, it's only when that person is repentant that a relationship can be established. Yes. So, so the person who's been harmed needs to see where they've been harmed, mm -hmm. and the person who's repentant needs to see where they need to be repentant and be repentant. Yes. And then a relationship can be established. Any time before then, a relationship is pretty much impossible. A loving relationship yep. is impossible on the part, you know, in terms of a relationship. A relationship the from God's perspective. The forgiving person can love them yes. still, but they won't be able to have a relationship with that person so who's not repentant It's not a given receive. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So, so this question is about this. How the abuser is affected. When you do the forgiveness. So, so when you, you truly forgive, yes. you're, you're getting to this point, right? Yes. This point where inside of you, there's no longer a desire for the relationship anymore. Or for the punishment. There's no need for, for it, is yes. probably the better way of saying it, yeah. rather than desire. Because it might be a desire for the relationship, but no need for it, no mm -hmm. addiction. Mm -hmm. There's no desire to punish the person mm -hmm. anymore either. Mm -hmm. There's no desire to make their life a misery or any yeah. of those things or or to, you know, to rant and rave about them to everybody else and what they've done and how terrible it was and all this yep. kind of stuff. No yep. desire for any of that. When you've got to that stage, now the dynamic between you and the, abu the, the person who's perpetrated the harm is very interesting. Yes. Because now the person who's perpetrated the harm emotionally can feel that you no longer accept the harm. Yeah which causes then a confrontation of their state, which is, I'm justified in doing the harm. Well, initially that would be the confrontation. Yeah. They will feel justified and they'll feel that, like they'll usually get angry with the person they yeah. harmed. They might even get more attacking and more abusive, which mm -hmm. is frequently the case. Yeah. And anybody who's gone through this with parents will know, they'll get more attacking, more abusive, more, you know, more of pretty much everything. Yep. until you know they've worked through the the issue and then they get to a stage usually where they start feeling guilt but even that's still not 
processing the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, they did harm. And then if they are sincere, which is very rare yeah. on earth, they get to the stage of being sorry for what they did sincerely yeah. and right, wanting to right the wrong. Yeah. And once they get into that stage and they work through, then they have to go through forgiving whoever they needed to forgive yeah. that triggered the entire behaviour in the first place. Yes. So they've got to go through three or four steps, right, before yeah. they reach the point of a relationship. Yes, <laughs> yes. So let's talk a little bit more about their, their potential reactions and their reactions. Yep. So it does depend a lot on the, the desire for humility and repentance within that person, doesn't it? It who's does. The person who's done the harm. Yeah. But obviously when we move into that state of forgiveness, they no longer receiving the endorse the support for the abusive behaviour. Oh, I keep saying abusive, but, you know, the harmful behaviour. Harmful behaviour. Um, but there's other aspects to it as well, isn't there? Like sometimes me going through the experience and really acknowledging the pain that's been created can actually have a, an impact upon that person depending on their state, can't it? It may even soften them to the fact of what they've done. Often it does. Yes. Yeah, often it does. Where because you are crying, for yeah. example, and working way through the pain, they start seeing, wow, there is a lot of pain this person has as a result of what I've done. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise that. You know, mm -hmm. They might not have realised why or anything. They may even start connecting to some of their own pain that they have with their own parents or whatever about that as well. You yeah. know, like yeah. what, 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 why, you know, which is some of the causal reasons as to why they treated their child or the person they harmed in such a manner. So, yeah, it can be a softening of the person yeah. depending on their level of humility. Depending very much on that. Because it, it is true, isn't it, that when this person is, has harmed me and has a feeling of justification of the harm... And there will always I be feel, anger under those circumstances. Yes, always anger. And, but if I'm feeling like oh, I'm, I'm angry also that that happened and I really want you to change before I do anything and I want to punish you... It's a very hostile environment being perpetuated by both of us, isn't it? That's right. Whereas if I move into the state of forgiveness, and if this person even has a slight amount of softness or reflection, so, you're right, like a lot of times the, the, the initial thing may be anger, but because I'm now in a state of love and softness about this, uh, even after the anger... that Yeah, let's be careful about word choice here, though. Okay. Softness doesn't mean... Passivity or... Or, or uh, compromise. Uh, no, not at all. So this is where most people go wrong. They believe yeah. softness means passivity and compromise. That's one of Sandra's problems is mm. that she believes that. It's not permissiveness. In fact, once we're forgiven, mm. it's the opposite of per permissiveness. That's right. We won't permit the sin anymore. No. And we might permit it in ourselves or in another in another and we'll be very clear about that mm -hmm. however we won't be aggressive we won't be angry we won't be vindictive we when won't you say be... aggressive um I, i'd have to argue a bit there too yeah. about that people's perception of aggression is very different on earth than i feel what god's perception is a, per a person who needs to be passionate about something being wrong so yeah. there's a difference between passion and aggression yes aggression is the desire to harm another with your passion. Mm -hmm. To be p powerful over another in your yeah. passion. Where, whereas a pa you, you've got to be passionate about what's right and what is wrong, you yeah. do. In the end, a person who has desires will be passionate about what is right and what is wrong. They will be freely speak about what is right and what is wrong. They won't cover it over. They won't try and cover it over to make everybody around them feel good and feel safe and feel like, you know, they, they're not like that. They're going to speak up, you know, they're going to stay in firm for what the truth is mm -hmm. in every case. Now, on earth, often that's uh, considered to be aggression. Yeah. But that's not what aggression is from God's perspective. So it's like in the first century when I said uh, scribes and Pharisees, offspring and vipers, you know, <laughs> you, you know, you, you, I said a number of things like strain out the gnat and gulp down the camel. You know, those are hypocrites. And, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, out, inside you're, you know, you're outside you look like whitewashed graves, but inside you look like dead men's bones, yeah, you know. Yeah, like yeah. You, in other words, uh, you know, what was inside of them was very different to what they portrayed. In other words, they had a huge facade that was mm -hmm. evil and false. Mm -hmm. And these are statements that I made in full passion. Mm -hmm. 
And at the time, the people who were around me heard it as aggression. Yeah. But but it, I wasn't feeling aggressive. It was just no. a statement of truth about the condition. Mm. And, you know, this is what I see in people today is that if you make statement, a passionate statement of truth about a position, people often interpret that as aggression. So mm -hmm. you've got to be careful about mm -hmm. what is aggression mm -hmm. from God's perspective, mm -hmm. what is passion from God's perspective and so forth. So perhaps then just to um, be a bit more specific, when I've reached this state of forgiveness myself yep. and the, pers the person eventually decides... Let's call them the perpetrator of the harm. The perpetrator decides or reaches a point where they are going to engage with repentance. Mm -hmm. My belief is if I've already reached that state of forgiveness, then it's a much more... Um, that person's still fully responsible for what they've done, but they don't have to contend with my attack or desire to punish them or anything as they would have if I was still in this state. True, but, but uh, you could say that they do cause all of your desire to... True. Yes. Uh, well, not cause it in a, in a, in a, in a secondary way. Yeah. Um, because you're resisting your own emotions as the receiver of, of yeah. the hurt... And um, as soon as you try to suppress your own emotions, of course, naturally you're going to result by trying to, you know, stop the yeah. other person who perpetrated the harm in some way, you mm -hmm. know, and try to control them. When you reach a point of forgiveness, you don't try to control them anymore. They yeah. are allowed to still do what they want to do. Yeah. Uh, they are allowed to still lie, still cheat, you know, whatever it is they wish to do. Mm -hmm. You've forgiven them for their behaviour. You also know their behaviour is wrong and you will not enter a relationship with them while their behaviour remains such mm -hmm. uh, in such, such a way. So it's like a loving boundary But it's not a punishment. Point. It's just yeah. waiting. You're in yeah. a waiting state. You're yeah. waiting for them to work through issues in order to re-establish a relationship. And it's not like you don't want a relationship with them. When you mm -hmm. forgive somebody, you still want a relationship with them. You don't need it. Yeah. There's a big difference between desiring it and needing it. Yeah. Um, most people who are in a state where they haven't forgiven need the relationship because they want the other person to repent mm -hmm. so that they then don't, they believe, don't have to feel the pain of their forgiveness. Yeah. But, but such a belief system is completely false mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, the, the pain that you have is inside of you mm -hmm. and you are going to have to feel it whether they repent or not. Yes. So you're better off getting that over and done with as soon as you can. Yeah. <laughs> but going back now then just to our point, does it make it easier for the perpetrator to repent if I've already forgiven? Well, that depends greatly on, on their humility, of course. Yeah. When, I say, when you say make it easier, well, on face value it might make it easier, but at the end of the day they do have to go through a quite a long process of working through what they need to repent mm -hmm. for, getting God's perspective on the matter, you know, working through the issues of forgiveness mm -hmm. related to what uh, they've been harmed and so forth before yeah. they'll fully repent. So, you know, that and that's going to take, you know, time and, and their effort and energy and, mm -hmm. and unless they're dedicated to that process, they, they probably won't do it. Yeah. So while it can relieve them of the burden of your punishment, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, sometimes they would prefer your punishment mm, because, it, because that helps them maintain their guilt rather than go into the deeper emotions they need mm -hmm. to go into. Mm -hmm. So maintaining a punishment on the part of the person who's been harmed, maintaining punishment towards the person who's perpetrated the harm can actually uh, assist the person who's perpetrated the harm to remain in their condition. Yeah. Uh, and not move through the processes mm -hmm. of repentance. So then, conversely then, it is true that if I choose to forgive, I am lessening the conditions under which a person feels... Can we say it this way? Yeah. I am creating a potential yeah. where the relationship can be re-established. Yes. Whether that is realised or not mm -hmm. will depend greatly now upon the person who needs to be repentant. Yeah. But I have, at least for my part, created the potential for the relationship to be re-established. Cool. And to recap, the effect of my forgiving on the person who's harmed me 
is often that they, because I'm now uh, clearer about the harm that was done, often there will be a response of rage and attempt to control me. Uh, well, usually that is, not, usually, not often, usually, usually that's usually the case. Yep. The reason why is a person who's harmed us or harmed anybody is usually in a well-established pattern of behaviour of harming people yeah. in that way in that the, they harm. You yes. know? And so when you start confronting that, there's usually a rageful uh, re, you know, response, response to your confrontation of that, mostly because the reason why they do it is based around their addictions mm -hmm. and they want their addiction satisfied. Yeah. So, so naturally, whenever you want an addiction satisfied and it's not satisfied, for the majority of people, the very first port of call is going to be rage. Yeah. And, and so that is usually the case where a person will firstly go through rage, mm -hmm. then they might ca calm down a bit, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes that might take a few minutes, and other times it might take 150 years, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah. It just yeah. depends on... Depends on how entitled you feel to doing exactly. the harm. Exactly. It depends yeah. upon the condition of the person perpetrating the harm yeah. as to how entitled they feel to continue perpetrating that yeah. harm. If it's well and truly established that they are entitled, then that's going to take a long time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've seen thousands of years, so yeah. it can take a long time in that state. So, yeah. so once uh, the person gets over that stage where mm -hmm. they feel justified perpetrating the harm, yeah. now usually they start doing all sorts of things to get away from the feeling that drove it, yeah. which includes feeling guilty but not dealing with the emotion. It includes like, you know, even getting a bit suicidal sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, but which is really a, ra a, a passive aggressive rage expression of not yep. wanting to deal with the emotion. Eventually they get through all of that. Yeah. And then they start honestly looking <laughs> at what they did. Yeah. And then they get through that, yeah. and, which is an emotional process. Mm -hmm. And then they have to start honestly looking at what was done to them to cause them to do what they did, mm -hmm. if anything. Mm -hmm. And then they need to work through that. So does my forgiveness increase the likelihood of a person doing that or it's really dependent upon the person, isn't it? Well, the, to a great extent, it's dependent upon the, the desire of the perpetrator yep. and, and their emotional condition. However, it can assist them to, to know that you will not accept their behaviour anymore. Mm. And, and when, when they know you will not accept it anymore, now there is pause in them to actually consider why it is that you will not accept their behaviour yeah. anymore. Yeah. And then, then that, that can cause them to contemplate matters. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't always, of course, cause yeah. them to do so, but it could. It could. Yeah. yeah. Okay. As I said, the forgiver has created the potential yes. for a relationship to be re-established. Mm -hmm. But now the relationship being re-established all depends upon the person who needs to be repentant. Got it. Mm -hmm. Am I obligated to love people that I've forgiven? So this is something that Sandra asks, mm -hmm. or she states really, that um, once someone... She's almost stating that it's one of our teachings. Yes. <laughs> but anyway. Which is a little... Which is quite funny, really. Problematic. Yeah. Um, uh, I should mention, though, in the break, the girls uh, who deal with the FAQ said that Sandra recently sent us another email which said, what do you do when you really can't understand what Jesus and Mary are telling you? So, which is what I said earlier is, in this you, presentation. You've answered that question. Yeah, so yeah. it also indicates that she didn't really understand what we've been previously saying. That's right. Yep. Anyway, she talks about this obligation to love people who harm us, and she also implies that forgiving means that I now have to, or she says, forgiving means I now have obligations to love people, yes, to love well, my enemies. There's a number of logical problems before yes. we even have the discussion. Yes. One is, uh, how does forgiving obligate me to love? Yeah. Surely if we are obligated to love, we're obligated to love before we even yes. went through forgiveness. Yes. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't make any sense that, oh, now that I've forgiven, I've obligated love, but before I've forgiven, well, I'm not obligated? Yeah. What? <laughs> if logically, you know, yeah. if that if obligation were true, yeah. it would logically be the case that if you're obligated to love, you're obligated to love in every circumstance, yes. not just... And so you're obligated to forgive, yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So anyway, the, there's a whole heap of problems with <laughs> the, the logical reasoning here, right? Yeah. So, which we've already discussed as to why that's the case. We have. Let's now talk about some facts on the matter. We are not obligated to love when we are forgiving. We are choosing to love, aren't we? 
when well, we engage the process of forgiveness. Yeah, let's look at this sort of a bit more deeply. Obligation and love are not two words that should ever be put together. They, they're <laughs> antonyms, not synonyms. That's right. As soon as you are obligated to love, you're no longer loving. Yeah. You're now doing something out of obligation, which is not love. Yeah. So, so the whole concept of being obligated to love is completely flawed. Mm -hmm. and, and the two words should never really be used together mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, like in, a, in this kind of manner. You know, it, love does place obligations upon us. But those obligations are actually desires, if you truly love. So can you, so say can you really say they're obligations? obligations? You, could, you could say, perhaps, that, that once we receive God's love, there are certain things we feel obliged to do, but, but the reality is you feel like you want to do them. So they're not So obligations. they're not really obligations either. No. You know what I mean? Yeah. So why you do feel you know, they have to be done, mm. you, you know, you feel like you, they want, you want them to be done. It's not... <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like um, duty and desire. You, very often we do things out of one of the two. A sense of duty, I don't really want to, but I've got to. Desire, I just really want to do this thing. But really what you're describing there is when I love people, there's a feeling of desiring to do the loving thing, which you could see. Well, perhaps we need to say it this way. When you love, you have a feeling inside of you that this is right. It is a right thing to do this. You know what I mean? It's like there's a feeling of what is truthfully right or what you could classify as righteous or, or, yes. or what's the proper thing to do. Yeah. Now, that's where we often sometimes think there's obligation, yeah. right? Because we know it's right. Yes. Right? So we know it's right. The question now becomes, do I want to do what is right mm -hmm. or do I want to not do what is right, but I feel have to? Uh, obliged. Which one is yeah. it? Now, a person who truly love wants to do what is right. Yes. A person who doesn't truly love feels obliged or duty to do what is right. Yeah. Right. So there's a big difference between those two Thanks. places. Yeah. So we could say in, in answer to this question about obligation, the primary thing we need to be concerned about is whenever we feel duty or obligation, mm -hmm. while we may know what we're doing is the right thing to do. Yes. Right. Or the moral thing to do from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're still not really doing it mm -hmm. until we do it with desire. Yeah. With love. Mm -hmm. then we're doing it. So is it sort of like um, a hollow action in that it's an action not filled with, the, with love, which is a desire? Well, I suppose it's, it's not completely hollow. Because if you did the opposite, it would be worse. Of course. Yeah. You know, if you, at least you're attempting to stop mm -hmm. unloving behaviour mm -hmm. and attempting to be loving, even mm -hmm. though you might not have a desire to do it. Yeah. You're not probably going to be able to sustain the behaviour. Yes. Because uh, sustained behaviour comes from your soul. Yeah. Unless you feel a desire, you're not going to do it. So you're not going to sustain. It's like a person who tries to sustain dealing with their emotions. You're not going to sustain it until you really want to do it. Yeah. Then you'll sustain it. Yeah. Until then, it's going to be fight it, fight it, fight it. You know, yeah. you might do it for a day or two, fight it, fight it. It's going to be like that. That's yeah. how it is. You sustain behaviour that you truly have a desire to do. Yeah. So, so while it's nice that you at least want to be doing the right thing, mm -hmm. and from God's perspective, that's better than wanting to do the wrong thing mm -hmm. or wanting to do nothing at all, yeah. as we've talked about in conversation, yeah. it is better that if we move from this state of duty yeah. or obligation to a state of love where yeah. we desire to yeah. do it. So... One is the attempt to be loving without actually feeling love. Mm -hmm. So can you be loving without feeling love? You can't. You can't, right? So it's just an action or a facade of love, but at least that's better than not loving at all. <laughs> <laughs> Although it really depends on what's motivating that, doesn't it? Well, at least, well, what I'm saying is better than not loving at all is that, is that, it, is that it doesn't create as many negative mm. consequences yeah so so it's a bit better you yep. know but it is not being loving no being loving is feeling the feeling of love and doing it yes that's why you do it and then you naturally feel impelled to do those actions 
So you could say, oh, I'm obliged, but I'm just obliged by the love within me. It's not because I, some external force or some... That's right. It's not yeah. some uh, obliged because God is demanding it or that I might yeah. be punished in the future or, you know, uh, uh, you know, a religious way is frequently like, you know, you're going to be in hell if you don't do it, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. It's not none of that. You yeah. know, that's not how it is when yeah. you love. Yeah. When you love, you do it because you desire to do it. And, and I think that, um, Sandra's question, am I obligated to love people I've forgiven? To me, it's the reverse. Once I've forgiven, um, my, well, sorry, my choice to forgive is actually a loving choice towards myself and others. Yeah, you, you can't even forgive without being driven love. by love. Exactly. You can't even forgive. Like, it's impossible for you to forgive without being driven by love. Exactly. Because it's the only, only reason for doing it. So love of yourself and for the other person. She's saying, oh, you've forgiven, now you have to love. I'm saying, no, no. if you're going to forgive, you're going to have to want to love. Yeah, and, and not only that, um, you can't forgive without loving. That's right. So, or, or without the desire to love. So, yeah. you know, so it makes no sense that love comes afterwards. No. Uh, love has to come beforehand. <laughs> or at know. least a desire to. Well, love. no, well, no, not even that. You, you, when you go through forgiveness, you will go get to a point where you love. Mm. And, you know, that once, like, you can't complete forgiveness without ending up in a loving space. Yes. You can't. Yeah. So, you know, there's yeah. no other way forward than to love. And then because you desire love and you want to love and you want to love yourself and you want to love them, you work through what you, whatever emotions you need to work mm -hmm. through. You have to come to love your own emotions as well yeah. in that process. And you work through whatever emotions you need to work through to get to a point where you're forgiven. And now that you're forgiven, you are loving on that matter. Yes. It's impossible for you to not be, in fact. Yes. And in fact, it's a gift you give to yourself, to the person who harmed you, to everyone, isn't and, it? Yeah, and the entire world. And the entire world. And, and every creation. Yeah. It's just incredible. Mm. Um, and love is a gift. It's so it's just all synonymous, really. With gifts. <laughs> With gifts and not obligations. That's yeah. right. Not obligations. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the concept of obligation, which she's saying here, you know, she's saying, does that mean you now have obligations to love your enemies? No, you've all. If, you already strictly decided. speaking, yeah. you've already had an obligation yeah. to love your enemies. If yeah. if you were going to ever love, yeah, you, you're already obliged to love your enemies. So it's not after you forgive. No. Uh, so logically, you know, yeah. it doesn't happen after you forgive. It happens beforehand. But you can understand why, because love is a desire-driven emotion, and forgiveness is a desire-driven yes. emotion. They're both driven by human desire. Yeah. So without the desire to do it, you're not going to do it. No. So if you're feeling like, oh damn it, I'm obliged. Yeah. then you don't desire to do it and you're not going to do it. No. And you, you, can't get, you can't like half do forgiveness or you can't sort of like, oh, you've got to have a really strong desire to do it. Yeah. And in that process, you give up all desires to do anything but love the person who harmed you. Yeah. You have to release all of them. But it's not the human view of love. That's right, because <laughs> many people, it's in my notes, including Sandra, have the false belief that loving and forgiving the person who harmed them would be a sign of weakness, passivity, or even approval towards the harm that was done. Yeah. And that's not the case. Or compromise. We, yeah. There's none of that. No. None of that. And it's not saying, oh, I forgive you so nothing, it, nothing matters about what you did. No. Not at all. Everything matters about yeah. what you did. In fact, in order to get to the place of forgiving, I have felt how all of it mattered and the way that it mattered and how yeah. much it and mattered. and it was really bad. Yeah. And, and I'm never going to hide that from you. Yeah, and I'm not going to, you know, you don't judge the person for it, but it is really bad what they did. And if, from God's perspective, if you could feel what God feels about when people do sinful things, mm -hmm. it's a pretty bad feeling, yeah. actually, yeah. because he, he feels pretty strongly, very strongly passionate that it's definitely wrong yeah. is the feeling that God has. Yeah. And that's the feeling you'll have when you go through the whole process and end up in a place of forgiveness. You'll feel, no, that's definitely wrong i yeah. can't compromise on that issue anymore anymore ever again ever again yeah. with anybody yeah mm. yeah sandra obviously has quite a bit of anger about what she perceives love to be mm. and that's what's showing up in her statements there and and a lot of her false definitions of love and her desire to not feel certain emotions that we've spoken about before is creating this massive resistance to forgiving. Mm. And she wants to find ideas that support the reason for not forgiving. And um, 
that's very evident in, in what we've just been discussing. That's right. Yeah. And this is a common thing for people on Earth. You know, this is why we, we stay in these terrible states on Earth, because we are always looking for the reasons why we shouldn't mm -hmm. forgive, while at the same time looking for the reasons why we should attack and abuse. Yeah. And at the same time, we um, also look at the reasons why we shouldn't forget, repent for yeah. what we do even repent for our lack of forgiveness yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, which is something we have to do. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of anger and rage in those kind of attitudes, which you can see played out in humanity, particularly again on earth, mm. because you can see all the interpersonal relationships, how much anger there is in them, all of the country based and social based interrelationships where there's so much anger in them. You can see all this and it comes about from not forgiving yeah. and and people want to justify the condition of not forgiving as well yeah. so that's yeah. the main reason for all of those responses mm -hmm. so yeah it's a it's an important thing to understand so am, are you obliged to love people who you've forgiven well you know as we can see there is no obligation in love so i'm so. never obliged to love anyone no, it's love a is a gift that, I choose that to you give. choose yeah. to give them. And if you don't want to choose to give a gift, then obviously there must be anger there. Generally yeah. there is. Of course, you don't have to give a gift. Um, but if you feel like resistance to giving gifts when it's in your power to give them, yeah. then there must be anger there. Yeah. Otherwise you would do it. Yeah. Um, any person who is in a loving state desires to give gifts to other people because it, they desire to help other people be happy. Mm. 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 Yeah. Am I obligated to do things for people who I've forgiven? So this is a little bit of an extension on our previous uh, question, mm -hmm. but Sandra speaks specifically of an obligation to do things for people who've harmed her once she's forgiven them. She says, once I forgive, I've, you know, I'm going to be obligated to do things for them. Uh, so... <laughs> There's a few things we need to say up front again, <laughs> just to reiterate, love and obligation are opposite things. Yes. Um, love and is a gift and as such never involves a sense of obligation. No. And since forgiveness is a loving process, it never results in me feeling obligated towards the person. Okay, so I'll never feel obliged to do something for them. No. I'll either decide I want to yes. or not. <laughs> and that's my that's next it. that's my next question for you. Yeah. Would I do things for people who I've forgiven? Oh, you've already done something by forgiving them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, yes, you of course gift. you will. Mm -hmm. Of course you will do things for people who you who you've forgiven who yeah. may even continue their behavior. I as you know, I do this all the time. I keep sharing yep. truth with people who, who I've had to forgive the last time we got together because yes. of their rage and their anger and whatever else they yep. projected at me. Yep. And and that happens all the time. Like so yep. there are, but I don't feel obliged to do it. No. And and also can I make a clear statement here? I may choose to do additional things beyond my forgiveness for the person I have forgiven but never in a way which endorses their unloving behaviour. That's right. You would, yeah. you would make an exception yeah. for endorsing any unloving behaviour on their part, which yeah. includes their addictions and whatever other unloving behaviour they yeah. may engage in, yeah. as long as you see such behaviour. Yeah, you know, Because obviously, if yeah. you're not perfect yet, you will, there's obviously areas that you don't see yet. Yeah. And, uh, that's, and that's normal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But but you you will at times feel like you want to do something for a person who has not demonstrated repentance and who you have forgiven. Mm. But you you would no longer need them to have a response to what you do. Yeah. So in other words, if I was addicted to um, people saying, oh, that's fantastic. Oh, yes, I, you know, I'll go and do something about what you've just told me. That's great. And, and they go off and they actually do it. And then they come back and they tell me they've done it. And if I was addicted to hearing all of that or, or responding to all of that, then my motivation for sharing the truth would then would be flawed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would I would only want to share the truth with them because it's an opportunity to share the mm -hmm. truth. And I like sharing truth with people because it helps them. Yeah. And whether they feel helped by it or not. Mm is the is the 
important thing. Do you think that people feel that even you spending time with them endorses their unloving behaviour? Well, yeah, in some cases I've had to stop spending time yeah. with them because they, uh, that for some people it does feel like it endorses their unloving behaviour. Yeah. Just they see your attention as approval and therefore just feel like... They That's can. right. And even if, if you're directly addressing what I've noticed is you yes. can be directly being incredibly direct with the person about how they're being unloving. Yes. But the only thing they're feeling is... Jesus is giving me attention. Everything is all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel good. Yeah, and I think we had an illustration of that in the 2014 assistance group when I was talking with Joy and Nina, I think yes, it was, yeah. uh, at the front. And yeah. when you came up, sat on my lap, and we discussed things together, you remember that yeah, conversation? Yeah, I do, yeah. And, you know, in that conversation, you know, they weren't hearing a single thing I was saying to them. Uh, because their addictions were getting met. Yeah. And under those circumstances, yes, it is very, it, it makes it very difficult to give them gifts. Yeah. Because every gift given, they assume to be approval mm -hmm. for their unloving behaviour. Yeah. And as soon as you can feel that from them, yeah. you can no longer give them gifts. Yeah. Which is, and this is how God is with us too. Yeah. As soon as God feels that his giving of gifts to a person is, um, aside from their general survival, you yeah. know, the, um, the gifts given by the laws, the natural operation. Yeah, of the so universe. in other words, if, if a person who hated me needed food, you'd give him some food, you know, of course yeah, you would. Yeah. Um, and he wouldn't probably see that, though, in that yeah. circumstance as, as a, um, you know, something as he'd earned or, yeah, he'd, yeah. So, you know, yeah. that it, you know, but rather just something that is out of the goodness of the heart you provided. Yeah. And, but a lot of people do enter this state where they believe that when you give them something, it means that they, you approve of them, you approve of their actions and you approve of whatever it is that they did to you. Mm -hmm. and, and as soon as that starts happening, you've got to be pretty careful there, yeah. you know, to, to look yes. at that. Yes. Yep. All right. But um, with these people who I have forgiven, I'm always going to, just to re finish off really, mm -hmm. I'll always act in a way that upholds love of them and me, crucially, mm. Mm. because um, prior to my state of forgiveness, I may have neglected one or both of those factors. Yes. Um, and that means that I will be both truthful and compassionate, with something that people think are antonyms, which are actually often synonyms. Yes. <laughs> um, so when I'm in the company of someone who I have forgiven, who I'm deciding to give more gifts to, that those would be the conditions, wouldn't they? Yes. Yeah. But can I also say, though, that this also applies to repentance. Mm. You might have done something to harm another. When you go through repentance completely, you'll get to the stage where you love them and you, you care about them and so forth and you care about what you did and you know what you did and you, it's very clear to you what you did, even though it might not yet be clear to them. Yeah. But you also won't put up with their abuse of you anymore either. Mm. And that's a very challenging place for mm -hmm. people around you, I've found, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, they feel that you should keep paying because yes. the person who hasn't forgiven wants you to keep paying of course. for what you did. And and so they, they will try to make you pay for what you did. Yeah. If you're in a state where you've been repentant, mm -hmm. you will no longer feel like you need to pay yes. for what you did, although you will take actions to do your best. Mm -hmm. to reverse whatever it is that you did. Well, it's very different, isn't it? Because often the person who hasn't forgiven, what they want is not for you to remedy the situation. Otherwise, they'd already be in the process of forgiving. That's because right. you would be trying to help them to see the harm that was done, to, to understand the effect that it's had on them. Yes, and, and I've had these kind of conversations with like my sons and yep. stuff like that, where, where I know I've harmed people and I have a conversation where, where I've said, look, I've harmed you in this way and in that way. And they're going, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. I'm going, yes, I have. You know <laughs> they I mean? don't want to deal with that. But sometimes they have some anger that they're using as a well, way to avoid that. Well, what I often feel is they often have other things where they feel I should be, yes. that I did harm them, where I didn't, you know, and yeah, things like that, or use anger like that. Or they feel something I've noticed is where you, when you raise your voice and to have a sense of entitlement that you give them things, that was actually harming them. Yes. Then when you realise that, that, I, I repent for that, for that. <laughs> stop that, 
Now you're continually trying to speak with them about their expectations to be looked after and for you to work for them. And I can't do that anymore. And you can't do it anymore. They feel like dad doesn't love me anymore. That's right. And, and for some, for, you know, it can be even more extreme than that, you know, that they just hate you for not giving them what they yeah. feel they need now yeah. and yeah. so forth. But there's nothing you can do about yeah. that. And all you can do is, like what I've found, is all you can do is just take that to God and see that's a consequence of your yeah. prior behaviour. And uh, and you know just ask for God to, for you know to forgive you for that prior behaviour mm. and to help that person work through the fact that that prior behaviour was wrong. Mm. You know what their expectations are now are wrong. Are wrong. Mm. And this is something I want to highlight later in our discussion as well. But what I find fascinating is that often the person, so the example you gave earlier, who doesn't want to forgive, but you have harmed them they prefer you to stay in this guilt-ridden state because they can manipulate that more. That's right. And this is where forgiveness and repentance are very powerful processes that most people misunderstand because before repentance and before forgiveness, I'm more open to manipulation from either people I've abused or people I uh, are abusing, abusing me mm. um, because I'm not willing to go through the emotions. They can use shame and guilt and threats and blackmail and whatever to get me to do what I, they want me to do. Yes. It helps them avoid their crucial process of either repentance and forgive or forgiveness as That's well. Right. When I go through it, no more power, just like in the situation you're describing with your sons. You want to remedy the cause within them. Yeah. You do what you can. You point it out. You try. You, you're very compassionate. You try and make time for that thing. Yeah. But if they're in resistance about forgiveness on that issue, they don't want that from you. They want no. Feel guilty. Do what I want. Meet yeah. my addictions yeah. because that helps me avoid what you're and trying to do. And the more you out. don't do that, the more angry they become yeah. frequently. Yeah. And that's the anger about forgiveness that they feel. Yes. So just like a person may have anger about repentance, yes. A person may also have anger about forgiveness. And in fact, I have seen some people who've been done terrible things, mm -hmm. like our brother Cornelius in the first yeah. century, or even yourself, some yeah. in some parts of your first century life done some terrible things and yet go through the process of forgiveness and uh, uh, sorry repentance, repentance. and yeah. and some of the people who were harmed by Cornelius yeah are still unforgiving to this yeah. day yeah so so that shows you that you can stay locked up yeah. in a place of a lack of forgiveness or a lack of repentance yes for long periods of time yeah. if you're not careful yeah and yeah yeah excellent yeah so so what I'm getting at there is the attitudes associated with repentance and forgiveness are very similar in a lot of ways, aren't they? Yes. They require desire to yes. be engaged and you can exercise a deep level of resistance. And when you do, you can stay in an angry state for long periods of time yeah. and not forever, fortunately. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anyone last longer than quite a few thousand years at this stage. But, you know, when I say quite a few thousand, there's some that I know have been like 100,000 years in that state. Yeah. But, you know, if sooner or later, God's laws will work their way through the issue. Yeah. And God's designed it that way, that eventually you have to work through the issue because your own pain and suffering will prevent you from staying in the place. Yeah. And, and that's a beautiful thing that God has done for us. It, it, it means that no matter how bad we've been personally, we can be forgiven. No matter how bad others have been, they can be forgiven by yes. us yeah. and and we can work through both sets of emotions mm -hmm. uh, and and reap the benefits of working through both sets of emotions without having to go through this long grinding process mm -hmm. of compensation mm. Mm. yeah and sandra's question here about ob being obligated to do things for people we've forgiven this both processes both forgiveness and repentance are massive gifts to people they, yeah. they are an act of giving and doing things for others as well as for ourselves and the way god's designed them is they cannot be obliged they cannot be forced they can, cannot be done out of duty it's the difference between compensation and repentance and forgiveness isn't it that's right we can't compensation is going to happen that, that we our will and desire are not involved in that but forgiveness and repentance by definition god wants us to develop a loving desire yeah, so it's probably can't... more true to say compensation involves our will because it's a corruption of our sorry. current condition. Yeah. 
but 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 does not des- involve our desire. Yes, yes, thank <laughs> whereas, you. Whereas all the laws regarding love involve our passionate desire. Yeah. And that's why the law of forgiveness and repentance is a higher law yeah. and it has faster results yeah. because it's involving our desire rather yeah. than our resistance. Yes. And, and whenever we just involve our resistance, now, of course, the lower laws have got to do their work, yeah. uh, getting us into a state of correction. Yes. Whereas uh, when we involve our desire, higher laws now can be engaged in our correction. Yeah, so is it a correct statement to say compensation obliges things of us? Of course it does. The law always does oblige yes. things of us. <laughs> and, and, but, the, but the forgiveness process is not obligatory no. and it's a love it's a love based process which is yeah. the reason why god rewards it much more, more greatly, greatly than he does the compensatory process absolutely because it, because it involves desire and therefore yeah. involves your true sincere motivations yeah. and uh, and you can see why god's designed it that way it's a very clever way of designing things to ensure that those people who have desires are rewarded yes whereas those people who don't have to deal with the law yeah and and it's a very if you think about it in a lot of ways humans recognize that same kind of uh, mentality when you go into a court if you have a desire to, to be sorry and you have a desire to prove to the court that you've done the wrong mm-hmm. thing and you know you have and you're not going to do it in the future mm-hmm. there's a higher likelihood the court will be more lenient with you than if you go there with this thing of I'm, I'm not guilty and I didn't do anything wrong when yes. everybody around you knows you have. A justification. And justify what you did and so yep. forth. Then, of course, they're not going to have any lenience. That's right. And in Australia, you, uh, judges are actually legally bound to take into account the state of a person's remorse or repentance for what they have done. That's right, which is a very good thing, it actually. Is. It's mm-hmm. one of the things that makes the justice system here in comparison yes. to other countries quite a lot more in line yeah. with God's way of doing things yeah. because there is a reward for doing the right mm-hmm. thing and mm-hmm. having the right attitude. Yes. And and that re- naturally should be the case. It should. And, be, yeah. and so, you know, that's the beauty of these laws is that you can even see them in mm-hmm. some of the, the humanity's legal systems. Yes. So you can see some of the laws there, but unfortunately, we don't apply them to the emotional state no. of, of, of the individual, whereas God applies them all to yes. the soul and all of the emotions yes. of the soul. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, okay. so yeah, this whole cons- thing of being obliged to, you know, to love and obliged to do things, both things are not true. We're not obliged to love, nor are we obliged to do things. However, if you truly loved, you mm-hmm. would have a desire probably to do things. Yes. But you would, in the case of doing things, you would take a lot of care that your doing of things didn't make things worse. In fact, if you've forgiven, you'd be quite sensitive to what would make it worse and what would make it better. That's right. And in the spirit world, it's especially noticeable in the hells when spirits from higher spheres go to the hells, they take a special care to not make the situation worse for Mm. the person they're trying to help by actually pandering to the person they're trying to help. Yeah. They always make sure that they are rigid regarding the laws Yes. Uh, with regard to what kind of help they can give. Mm-hmm. So they don't try to do so much that the person then believes they can get away with more. Yeah. And, and this is something that we will not do once we're forgiven. We will not, we will not help the person who's harmed us to get away with more. Yeah. And, and to believe that we would do so is an error in our own concept of forgiveness. Mm. Yeah. So, mm. and also an error in a concept of love. Mm. A person who truly loves somebody does not assist another person to harm themselves or harm another, or harm the environment for that matter. So, you know, a person who truly loves cares about those things mm-hmm. and understands God's laws about those things and wants to practice God's laws about those things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Thank you.